So good morning. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you this morning from God's Word, and I'm not going to pretend it isn't also a pleasure to be in church without a mask on. That's, it's a perk, being the speaker, but it's also, it's practical. Communication's not as clear when you can't read my lips, and I'm muffled by a mask. The, f- <laughs> the fact that my hair is a little shorter than usual is a testament to the barriers of communicating with the mask. I had I had a coupon for a free haircut at this barbershop, so I went in and I said, you know, just make it short, but I want to be able to comb it on top, and I think what they might have heard is, I definitely don't want to be able to comb my hair <laughs> on top. So I'm just glad I went in on, on Monday and not Saturday, so... I came home, and it looked like maybe I had enlisted, but <laughs> Lois's son-in-law, Steve Veltman, used to attend here a long time ago. One time he came to prayer meeting, and, and you could tell he had gotten a haircut that didn't maybe turn out so great, and his wife, Kathy, maybe it was one of the first times that she had done it, and he was just really chill about it, and he said, do you know the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut? And the answer is not $20. The answer that he gave is two weeks. <laughs> it's just hair. It grows back, and the Lord is faithful to keep us humble. I want there to be no confusion in my message today. I want the word of, the word of God to speak to your hearts, and I will relish the opportunity to be challenged alongside of you. We'll see what this historical book of First Samuel, and the Bible can teach us about God and about life about ourselves. I'm thankful to be following Jack. Not only did he convey a very clear message last week, but he also did a good job of laying the foundation for the whole series and getting at the heart of the life and the book of First Samuel. As he stated, well, God demonstrates that it is he who provides the victories for Israel, both externally and internally. And we'll naturally touch on the topic of God's sovereignty as we dig further into the life of Samuel. Today, we'll be touching on the end of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3. We can't help but see this idea of sovereignty through these passages. It's the same with the Jeremiah series that we did last year. No matter what the cultural circumstances are that are going on, the sin issues that are going on, or the players that are in the game at any time, God is in control. He has a plan. He's enacting it. He's bringing about both the ending that he has determined, but he is also choosing the manner in which it will be done. As I was reading through 1 Samuel again, um, I found it interesting that Samuel was a man of God, advising and directing people who were God's people. This is the nation of Israel. And yet, they so often made selfish and unfortunate decisions. A couple weeks ago, Stephen Carpenter was sharing from the book of Daniel, also a godly man who was directing and uh, influencing people in leadership, but ungodly rulers, enemies of God even, and often they made wise decisions because of Daniel's influence. And so a direct contrast of situations in that God uses them both. God isn't just influencing situations, he is orchestrating them. Within that bigger scope and perspective, there are so many smaller things also going on. God is always at work on an internal plan, but he remains personal. While affecting nations and kingdoms, he's speaking to individuals and families, as Jack was talking about last week. I love that, as we can be about the work of things on a large scale and simultaneously be experiencing and appreciating God at a personal level. On my family's recent trip to Alaska, we went up to see the Sturm family that this church sent up there. Um, Brad Sturm and I were, were marveling at the many little things that God had worked together to connect their family, both to Forge Road and to where they ended up in McGrath, Alaska, and that church up there. And one of those little things that we were talking about involved me and an overbooked flight and a busy friend. And I shared several years ago about how Cass and I had reconnected with Brad and Lindsay after Six years, we knew them in college, and then we kind of had gone different ways 
on graduation, God had taken them to language school in Costa Rica, and then they were planting a church in Mexico. God took Cass and I to Minnesota, and then eventually back to Baltimore here in Forge Road. And uh, on one of my trips visiting Minnesota with Cass, um, the, the flight was booked. And I volunteered to take a later flight, and as you know, compensation, they gave me a free round trip ticket anywhere. So they're like, we'll give you a free round trip ticket. I took the bait. Um, and so my thought was that I would use that free round trip ticket to go visit a, a young man that I had known in Minnesota. I kind of mentored him a little bit. He had graduated college, got married, started a family, and he was in the Northeast. And so I was looking at flights up there. And I call him, and I eagerly, I was like, hey, this is a free trip ticket. Can I come see you? And he, he said, he, basically, no. It's a bad time. This stuff's really crazy now. I won't be able to be the host that I'd like to be if you were to come right now. So I thought that was kind of God, like, here's this free ticket. Go, do, go, go meet with this guy. Um, so I, I look where else, that the, where else does the airline go and get a free ticket. They had just started flying to Mexico. Brad and Lindsay are in Mexico. I call them up, like, hey, how about a visit? Absolutely. So I go down for a couple of days. A year later, we go back as a family. The rest is history. It's one of those things where God takes these little things, and then Brad was talking about conversation he, he had with Jack that kind of planted this idea of Alaska and all kinds of things that orchestrated to work out for them to be where God has them now. We never know what God will use, and we don't ever fully see how he works, but he does give these glimpses, these small instances where he still accomplishes what he wants, but he also allows us to feel uniquely touched by his attention to our thoughts, our desires, and our prayers. As I was discussing this passage that we'll look at today with my wife, Cass, she said, you know, that concept, that's just a beautiful confirmation of who God is and how he works, that we can be attending to all these things and have certain things in our hearts and minds, and yet he's allowing those things to be the things that accomplish what he wants. So the key thought that I wanted to unpack today is not the sovereignty of God in, in what he is doing, but how he is doing it. In 1 Samuel 2, verses 11 through, through 3, 21, that's the whole book, the whole chapter 3, we're given a comparison that goes back and forth between two sides. On one side, we have this individual, Samuel, who um, was introduced last week, and he's the main figure of the series. But on the other side, we have two sons of, of Eli, who is the, who's the head priest. And, and he was also introduced last week. He was the one that had showed favor towards Hannah. He had sent her on her way with a blessing. And ultimately, he's the person who ends up raising Samuel from a boy into adulthood. His two natural sons are named Hophni and Phinehas. And although also raised by Eli, they are starkly contrasted against this young boy dedicated to the Lord by Hannah and Elkanah. The section comes in three parts. We're given some background on the characters, and then this is followed by a word from the Lord to Eli. And lastly, we see God moving forward with his plan, determining that he will use Samuel and not Hophni and Phinehas to play the key role in the transition in time of judges and the institution of a kingdom under Saul and then David. So they're at this in-between. He's going to establish Samuel. I like to start in the middle, or in this instance, very close to the middle. I want to start right before the middle part, where in two verses we get a glimpse of what God is thinking towards both parties. So in 1 Samuel chapter 2, end of chapter, I'm sorry, end of verse 25, and end of 26. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. And that was referring to Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's natural sons. Immediately after that, verse 26, it says, Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. The author deliberately goes back and forth between Samuel and Eli's sons, contrasting between a good example and bad examples. And these two verses show the point right before the Lord is going to act. Kind of like 
top of the climb on a roller coaster, right before a big plunge. Things have been building, and if you read just this, this snippet, these two verses, you'd be walking into something where you, you could feel like this is overly dramatic. Maybe if you didn't know the context, you would think this could be a little harsh. One of my favorite storytellers is Brian Donahue. He's spoken here before. He tends to teach with stories. And when we go to Mexico, almost everything he teaches, we remember because he's so great with the stories. And so one time teaching in Mexico, he said, if you were to walk into my house and you see my, my young daughter drawing on the wall with a marker, and then you saw me react with strong reprimands and a serious punishment like, that's it, I can't believe you would do that. You're a disobedient daughter. You're breaking my heart. Now I'm going to take away your allowance. and No play dates for two weeks. And if you're not in school or in bed, you're doing chores. And your reaction to that could be one of concern, like, Brian, settle down. Maybe he's blowing things out of proportion, and maybe the punishment doesn't quite fit the crime. It, you know, get a Mr. Clean sponge there. <laughs> but then he said, what if I took you in the rest of my house? And every wall and every room, even the ceiling, has marker all over it. And he tells of the ongoing battle they've been having with their daughter, where she's been given chance after chance to mend her ways. And she's been talked to. They've explained the need to respect their authority and their home. And she's promised time and again to stop, but it seems that every opportunity she finds more ways to be disobedient. And you happen to walk in right when the camel's back breaks, right? That was the last straw. This is a made-up story. Brian's daughter doesn't draw on the wall. But he uses his point in all that is to explain that's kind of God's relationship with Israel in the Old Testament. If you only saw like 40 years in the desert, snakes biting people, captives, being taken captive, taken out of their land, being defeated in battle in some of the ways that they were, some of the ways that Bill was talking about this morning of God showing wrath towards people, that, that you could get the picture that God is a harsh father. And then you see their deliberate and defiant behavior. They're seemingly insatiably, I'm sorry, they're seemingly insatiable hunger, hunger for all the things that God has set them apart from. Those are the things they're trying to do. The complaining and the refusal to show faith in their faithful father. You tend to think he's not so harsh after all. And it's the same here. This is very strong language when it says, they would not listen to the Father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. This follows Eli spelling out his grief towards his son's behavior. He's warning them, and he's telling them to be careful and to change, but they won't listen. Why? Because they don't want to, but also because God doesn't want them to. And we could spend a whole day discussing that little statement alongside the passage where Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And when God causes David to take a census and then punishes him for taking a census. And then even passages where God's doing things like closing Sarah's womb before she has Isaac. And last week when God closes Hannah's womb before she has Samuel. The statement that the Lord desired to kill them may seem unfair to some. They picture Eli's wanting to, re or his sons wanting to repent and listen to their father, but that God's somehow preventing that. That's not, that's not the case at all. God judged Eli's sons this way. He gave them exactly what they wanted. They did not want to repent, and God did not work repentance in their hearts. God saw they were corrupt men and wanted to judge them. When the Lord desired to kill them, it meant that God desired justice towards Eli's sons. And the next verse essentially shows their opposite. Samuel grew in favor with the Lord because he continued to do things that pleased God. Hophni and Phinehas are far gone in disobedience, while Samuel is very much alive in submission. We'll follow this path a little bit later, but before we do, let me just drop this bomb. Neither Hophni and Phinehas nor Samuel knew God at this juncture.
But first, let's jump back to the start of our text for today, 1 Samuel 2.11, right where Jack left off after Hannah's exalting and prophetic prayer. It says, Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of the priest. The Living Bible translates it well, The child became the Lord's helper. Samuel was just weaned. Hannah had him until he was outside of that first phase of childhood, many believe about five years old. And then he is left full time to live in the tabernacle with Eli. And he becomes the Lord's helper. And he is ministering to the Lord. He is doing what his parents promised him to. And what Eli shows him to do, followed by, by the very next verse, flips to Hophni and Phinehas again. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Other translations say they were corrupt. The literal translation from Hebrew calls them sons of Belial. Belial was a pagan god. And the phrase sons of Belial refers to worthless and wicked men, men acting directly against the God of Israel. Yet they're the sons of the high priest. They are training to succeed him as high priest. If anyone should be setting the standard for service to God, it should be them. But they aren't doing it. The following verses list their many offenses. If you look down through that, the thing they were doing that was displeasing God, they were stealing from God. They were taking what was God's part of their job. People would bring the meat to them to be sacrificed, and they would burn it as an offering before God. Um, and as laid out in Deuteronomy, like there was part, God was going to take care of them. He was going to give them portions of meat. You can have this part and this part, but th these parts are for me, especially the fat. That's an offering to the Lord. And what they were doing was taking whatever they wanted. They weren't even sneaky about it. People were saying, well, let's give the Lord his por portion first, and then you could take what you want. And they're saying, no, give us what we want, and if you don't, we'll take it by force. And in connection with these abhorrent actions, these verses also say that because they were greedy and violent and using intimidation, it was making people not want to come and sacrifice and worship the Lord. Later in the chapter, it says they were also using their positions as priests to have sex with women who worked in the tabernacle. So in the house of God, men who are supposed to be serving God are dishonoring their positions and the place set aside for worship of God, and ultimately, they're dishonoring God himself. They were causing the Lord's people to transgress. They were leading women who served there into immorality. And we know that the tabernacle had so much representation and that it was used to teach them about the nature of God, their sin, His holiness. It was also teaching the people of this time and generations to come about their need for the coming Messiah. And the actions of Hophni and Phinehas were as blatantly dishonoring and self-serving as it got. They didn't just not respect what was going on. Verse 17 says, they treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. And the pattern of the author, the very next verse, 18, says again, Samuel was ministering before the Lord. And then it goes into a little de detail, and we get a little tidbit about how his mother Hannah used to bring him a new little robe that she made for him when she and her husband visited annually to offer their yearly sacrifice. And so this shows the passage of time. Each year, as he is growing, Samuel continues to minister to the Lord. Verse 21 says, And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord, which is then followed immediately by Eli rebuking his sons. That ends with that statement, They would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord put them to death. So now we have the full backstory. 
the boy born from grief and promised to God, the unrepentant priests, priests who abuse their positions, who have no regard for the Lord and they hold contempt for the things done to honor and worship the Lord. And now we see God didn't work repentance in their hearts because they did not desire to repent. J.I. Packer says in his book, Knowing God, that the unbeliever has preferred to be by himself without God, defying God, having God against him, and he shall have his preference. Nobody stands under the wrath of God except those who have chosen to do so. This is a hard concept, but it speaks to that beautiful confirmation of who God is and how he works that I mentioned before. Somehow, God blessed Hannah with Samuel because it was both her deepest desire as well as his plan. And she desired in this way because she could not bear children. And she could not bear children because God had closed her womb. God will determine the death of some ungodly priests even as they have determined to be set against God. Opposite the evil sons, we have Samuel, who would be the leader Hophni and Phinehas should have been. But they can't be the leader because they will die. And they will die because God desires them to. And he desires them to because they are evil and unrepentant. And somehow, in the mystery of how God is working out his will, he is both totally in control of all the things, while simultaneously allowing people to choose whatever they want. What if I hadn't thought about taking advantage of a free round trip ticket? What if I just been like, eh, I want to get there on time. I don't want to wait three more hours for the next flight. What if the first friend I'd hoped to visit had decided to make it work out? Yeah, come up here. Awesome. Doesn't matter. Somehow, God uses both the events we were seemingly directing as he ultimately directs them himself. And that doesn't always fit into a specific theological framework, I know. But it is what the word of God and this passage here is saying. Back to the middle of our passage today. We started with the state of things, the non-repentance of Eli's sons, and Samuel growing in favor with the Lord. And then right after that verse, the first two verses I read, is a visit by an unnamed man of God who visits Eli, and he speaks harsh words to him. And it's, it's a good chunk, and I'm not going to take the time to read the whole thing now, but in verses 27 to 36, he, Eli is told, you have honored your sons above me, God. You've honored your sons above above God. And he also says, the days are coming when God will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house. Now, Eli is in the line of Aaron, of the tribe established to act in the priestly duties, and that's going to end in his family with his sons. I just wanted to point out that God is not limited by traditions and history how many times is the younger brother chosen in the lineage of Abraham? How many times does God use, as Jack pointed out, the flawed, imperfect, and unexpected to serve his perfect will? He includes the Gentiles in his blessing of a Savior promised for the Jews. He chooses to use broken figures because he wants to be visible through the cracks. He doesn't need Hophni and Phinehas anymore. Then he needed Ishmael and Esau. And to effectively cut off the possibility of their leadership, the man of God tells Eli that both his sons are going to die on the same day in the near future. And they're going to be replaced by a faithful priest. And the line goes to another family. And somebody else fills those roles. Everyone left in Eli's house after that will be relegated to insignificant roles. So we arrive at the third part of our passage today, which includes the one story of Samuel's childhood that if, if you ever attended Sunday school, you probably heard it. And again, this part starts with the phrase, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Chapter 3, verse 1 goes on to say, 
that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. We can't forget where in the Old Testament timeline we are. God has used many judges and prophets during their struggles from a fledgling group of wandering, just freed slaves to conquerors of the promised land. And they're still there, but they're on the verge of being a kingdom, and yet their hearts are still tending to stray. They are God's chosen people, but they often do not choose him back. So why would he speak frequently to hard-hearted people where even the priests have a reputation for mocking the very things that are supposed to draw them close to God? God calls to Samuel in the middle of the night. Multiple times, but Samuel thinks Eli's calling him, and that's what I remember from Sunday school, that it was kind of this awkward, funny situation where Samuel keeps getting up, and Eli's like, go back to bed, I didn't call you. And it happens again, go back to bed, I didn't call you. 1 Samuel 3, 6 and 7 says, And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you've called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Earlier I said, neither Hophni and Phinehas nor Samuel knew God at that juncture where they were basically being framed as this is the state where they are with God. And this passage bears this out. Samuel's godly. He's obedient and serving God wonderfully. He's the Lord's helper. Yet he hasn't given his heart to the Lord. And now the Lord will be revealed to Samuel and he'll, he'll have to make a choice. I think the first couple chapters of this book could be used as part of a parenting class, both as a how-to and a, and a how-not-to. We saw some interesting things last week regarding parents, and this week regarding parents, especially a father. But this isn't just for parents. It's for anyone influencing young people, and that, that includes all of us. Your words, your example more than anything, they're being witnessed. You aren't making anyone a follower of God, just so we're clear doesn't depend on you, but he uses you. Even children raised in the most godly home must be converted by the Spirit of God. But in this part of our text, Samuel is now hearing God speak to his heart. An application from this passage is absolutely to be intentional in parenting and raising kids, viewing our children before God and in service to them. But more than anything, I think, the application is to pray that they will listen when God speaks to their heart, that they would not resist being changed by the Spirit of God. Eli must have had shortcomings. He seemed to do a good job with Samuel, but his sons are not in line, and the lecture to his boys in chapter 2 smacks of the frustrated parent who is heavy with instruction and light with the leading. I saw a video that was funny and also sad. A dad is filming his two sons that have, the sons are tearfully showing off their horrible haircuts that he just gave to them. And you start to gather why they have, and they're not just bad, they're embarrassing haircuts. Like he's intentionally, one is a reverse mohawk. One looks like an old, it's just bald in the middle, lots of hair around. One's got a swirl shaved all the way around his head. Um, and the father's saying, hold up your report cards. All failing grades. What'd you get in that class? Bad grades. And he says, you want to act like thugs in school? Then I'm going to give you a haircut like a thug. I don't know if you've seen it. The kids are just like, he's going to make them go to school and explain to their friends they have a bad haircut because they got bad grades. And maybe, maybe that's the kind of tough love some kids need. Maybe, like in Brian's story, I don't know the whole thing. There must be a storm coming. I'll just speak a little louder. 
So may, maybe I don't know the whole story with what's going on in that particular video. But could it also be that the father who sets homework time each night, sits down with his sons and struggles through algebra with them, will find less to be upset about when the report cards come out? We know the verse, train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Training is so much more than telling someone what they should do. It involves demonstration and the ability to correct them. Somewhere along the line, Hophni and Phineas started getting off track. And their father doesn't take action severe enough to stop them from going down that path we find them on. Or to remove them from their roles. Maybe they, they made deliberate decisions as adults. And they were you know, grown, no longer under the, his authority as a, a father. But he's still the high priest. And they are priests in training. He's their boss in the priesthood. And we cannot take lightly the responsibility to instruct and model godliness to those placed under us. It does not guarantee that they will listen when God speaks to their heart, but it is what we are commanded to do. And God continually blesses these efforts throughout the Bible, both in the New Testament and the Old. Hophni and Phinehas have hearts turned against God, hearts that mock everything related to God. Samuel listens, and Samuel obeys. In the story of God calling to Samuel in the middle of the night, when the confusion gives way to understanding, and Samuel finally says, Lord, here's your servant, speak to him. The plans that God has for Samuel are alluded to, but mostly he just speaks judgment against Eli and his sons. Before telling Samuel that he's going to punish Eli, he says, I'm about to do things in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that's poetic. And it speaks both to the incredible downfall of Eli and the other trials of all, for all of Israel, but it, also the great things that God is going to do. Samuel will be there for all kinds of stuff that happens. Goliath, you know, the establishing of the kingdom, that people are going to hear about this stuff and their ears are going to tingle. Samuel's not fully told what, but during this series, we'll see many situations that he will be placed in the very center of, asked only to speak for God and to be faithful to him. Chapter 3 ends with encouraging news. And in fact, I'll steal the very beginning of the first verse in chapter 4 from Joel, who has next week. But it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. As our last comparison comes with this section as well, Hophni and Phinehas throughout the chapter have this reputation. People have heard of, Eli says to them, people are telling me about your disobedience. And they're soon to be destroyed. But here, Samuel is known as the mouth, mouthpiece of truth and a prophet of God. And he is about to be used mightily. God is not beholden to priests. He can turn anyone into his representative. He uses miracle babies born to a nobody family. He uses fishermen, tax collectors, and even murdering Pharisees. We do not want to be ignorant of what God desires, and we don't want to turn away from the responsibilities that he has given us. His will is going to be accomplished with or without you. But there is unimaginable blessing and purpose in allowing him to direct your thoughts and your actions. Blessing in honoring him above ourselves and above our sons and daughters. Ears will tingle when they hear of the things yet to come. And may it be said of us that the Lord was with us and we have been established as his. Let's close in prayer. Father, Thank you 
for not only being Lord over all things, but for proving it time and again. May we be emboldened to obedience through your faithfulness to your own designs. Allow us to see your purposes in life's events and the opportunities you have for us to show faithfulness to you. And I pray for our hearts to not be hardened, for us to continually seek after you, that it may be said that it is Christ living in us. Give us the strength to be humble models of Christ to the next generation and to allow them to respond to your seeking of their hearts. Allow that we be excited to do your will, even as the world often feels like it is going off the rails and the future is uncertain. Your will be done as we know it will be. We love you. Amen.